One of the most shocking parts of history was how people rose up in revolution and war against their kings and queens. But there are a few brutal and barbaric examples in history of kings and queens who were executed at the hands of their own people. Some of those monarchs were considered tyrants and whose executions were seen by some as needed to spark necessary change. But others were said to have been victims of other rulers who were condemned for treason and being traitors who plotted against the other monarchs. But after these executions, there were many examples of those kings and queens who were executed having their coffins broken into for many different reasons, from curious people wanting to check the history books to others who wanted to venerate them after their reputations shifted. This is opening the coffins of the executed kings and queens. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Charles I was the king who lost the English Civil War, and he caused the deadliest conflict that ever broke out on English soil, and he was a very bad monarch. His death warrant was signed by many men including Oliver Cromwell, and his trial was seen by many as a sham. But after the execution, there was a huge debate as to what to do with the remains of Charles, and the man who had brought civil war to England yet again. But Parliament were concerned that Charles would be seen as a martyr, and that his body would be recovered and venerated as a relic, but Charles would be buried in a place which was considered secret, and it would be lost to time for centuries, but then his coffin would be broken into and opened 200 years, after the Axeman did his work. King Charles I's execution was a momentous day, and on the day of his execution he was escorted under armed guard from St James's Palace, where he stayed to the Palace of Whitehall. That evening carpenters had been busy at work creating an execution scaffold for the crowds, to see the proceedings, and this was set up outside a window of the banqueting house. This was so big that everyone had a good view from around, and thousands would gather to witness the king losing his head. Charles was led out through a window, and he made a speech which was difficult to hear due to the commotion. He would state that an unjust sentence that I suffered to take effect is punished now by an unjust sentence on me, but I must tell you that their liberty and freedom consists in having government, it is not their having a share in their government, this is nothing appertaining unto them. A subject and a sovereign are clear different things. Before finishing, I shall go from a corruptible to an uncorruptible crown, where no disturbance can be. His words were ominous, and were those of a man who believed his time on earth was up, but Charles would then give himself over to the executioner at around 2pm. He lowered himself onto the executioner's block after saying a prayer, and he signalled to the executioner that he was ready. In one hard blow from the axe, the king's head was taken off, and the crowd that day, it's believed, sighed very loudly, as they were mixed in their feelings about the king's execution. Some rushed to the scaffold to dip their handkerchiefs in the king's blood, but the executioner skipped a number of parts, as he did not show the head to the crowd, to avoid being identified, and then following this, the remains of the king were collected in a coffin, they were then taken back inside the palace, ready to be prepared for burial. It's believed that the head was then placed back on the body, as a doctor and physician would use thread to tie this back on, and the remains of Charles I were then also embalmed. Following this, his body was then placed inside of a lead-lined coffin ready to be buried, but there was a pause in proceedings, as there was a significant worry as to where the king would be buried. The commission established by Parliament to deal with the king's execution and death believed it was too risky for the king to be buried in the middle of central London, and in particular within the confines of Westminster Abbey. Parliament were terrified by retribution following the king's death, and they were worried about royalists rising up to fight back with a purpose and a cause. They were concerned that his burial place would have become a shrine also, and that people would try to dig his remains up. But because of this, the commission then looked for other suitable places to bury a king, and they settled upon Windsor Castle, and in particular St George's Chapel inside of the castle's walls, and this was believed to have been much quieter. Of course, in recent times, Queen Elizabeth II was buried inside of this chapel, and many of the kings and queens of England have been laid to rest inside of the royal vault, along with other members of the royal family. But Parliament made the decision to bury the king rather quickly and quietly, and under the cover of darkness. Charles's coffin was taken during the night on the 9th of February 1649, and it was taken on a short journey from central London to Windsor.
moving the king's remains was kept quiet. It did not attract a huge amount of scandal and controversy. The place specifically where Charles was buried was in the same vault as a notorious Tudor monarch, King Henry VIII, and his third wife, Jane Seymour. This was found in the choir and under the floor, and this was considered a rather secret place. But Charles II, Charles I's son, would dream of building his father a huge mausoleum, but still today under the floor of the chapel, Charles is laid to rest. The burial was seen by a number of the king's former servants, but 200 years after the execution of the king, the coffin of King Charles I would be opened, and it was believed it had been lost to time, but it was found. During 1813 there was building work being carried out inside of the chapel, and because of this builders accidentally broke into the vault, containing the remains of Charles I, Jane Seymour and King Henry VIII, as well as a child of Queen Anne. They noticed that Henry's coffin was broken up and in a bad way, but then the coffin of Charles I was located as it had markings on top of it. It was then decided that the coffin would be opened up, and this was done on the 1st of April 1813 in front of the Prince Regent, the future King George IV. The man who opened the coffin was Sir Henry Halford, and he examined the body of Charles I and broke into the coffin. He saw the king's head and made an image of it, and when he removed the coffin lid, he came across a plain lead coffin with an inscription on it saying King Charles, 1648. He then made an opening in the top part of the coffin lid, and the internal wooden coffin was in a bad state, and the body of Charles I had been prepared in many different ways. It had been wrapped in many layers of seer cloth, and this was prepared with resin, which had preserved the body well. The body was so well wrapped, that it was difficult for Halford to take the body out of the coffin, and try to unwrap it. It was said of the king's remains that, at length the whole face was disengaged from its covering. The complexion of the skin of it was dark and discoloured. The forehead and temples had lost little or nothing of their muscular substance. The cartilage of nose was gone, but the left eye in the first moment of exposure was open and full, though it vanished almost immediately, and the pointed beard so characteristic of the period of the reign of King Charles was perfect. The shape of the face was a long oval, many of the teeth remained, and the left ear in consequence of the interposition of the unctuous matter between it and the seer cloth was found entire. It was difficult at this moment to withhold a declaration that, notwithstanding its disfigurement, the countenance did bear a strong resemblance to the coins, the bus, and especially the pictures of King Charles I by Van Dyck, by which he had been familiar to us. It is true that the minds of the spectators of this interesting sight were well prepared to receive this impression, but it's almost certain that the facility of belief had been occasioned by the simplicity and truth of Mr. Herbert's narrative, every part of which had been confirmed by the investigation so far as it had advanced, and it will not be denied that the shape of the face, the forehead and eye, and the beard are the most important features by which resemblance is determined. When the head had been entirely disengaged from the attachments which confined it, it was found to be loose and without any difficulty was taken up and held to view. It was quite wet and gave a greenish red tinge to paper and to linen which touched it. The back part of the scalp was entirely perfect and had a remarkably fresh appearance, the pores of the skin being more distinct, as they usually are when soaked in moisture, and the tendons and ligaments of the neck were of considerable substance and firmness. The hair was thick at the back part of the head and in appearance nearly black. A portion of it, which has since been cleaned and dried, is of a beautiful dark brown colour. That of the beard was a redder brown. On the back part of his head was more of an inch of length, and had probably been cut so short for the convenience of the executioner, or perhaps by the piety of friends soon after death, in order to furnish memorials of the unhappy king. At some point Halford even held the head up and analysed it, confirming that this was in fact King Charles I without any doubt. He said of this that, the muscles of the neck had evidently retracted themselves considerably, and the fourth cervical vertebrae was found to be cut through its substance traversely, leaving the surfaces of the divided portions perfectly smooth, and even an appearance which could only be produced by a heavy blow, inflicted with a very sharp instrument. This confirmed that Charles I had lost his head by a sharp axe, handled by a skilled executioner. It was then said that, Following the examination of the head, which served every purpose in view, and without examining the body below the neck, it was immediately restored to its situation, the coffin was soldered up again and the vault closed. 
but Halford would allegedly steal parts of the remains of the king, and he removed the vertebrae from the king, and he would show this off at dinner parties to his guests. Charles I was a king who would lose his head for being a man who plunged the country into civil war, and he was by all standards a terrible monarch. But his execution was one which scarred a country and a nation, and shocked everyone around the world. But centuries later the king's coffin would be opened, and his remains would be tampered with and disturbed. Mary had been a constant thorn in the side of the Tudor Queen for some time, and she did get involved in a number of plots to oust Elizabeth from the throne, and with this the English Queen and her council had enough, and they ordered the death of Mary Queen of Scots. Mary herself had a rather tragic and turbulent life, and her end was just a cherry on the cake, as she would be married a number of times, but each of these marriages was disturbing in itself. She married the young King of France, who died at a young age, then married a man who would be assassinated and allegedly blown up whilst he slept, but then her third husband was a man who treated her awfully and forced the Queen to marry him, but he was also accused of murdering Mary's second husband. But following her execution, Mary Queen of Scots's story was not over, and she was a queen who would be buried twice, and her remains were not treated with dignity or respect until decades later. The plot that secured the execution of Mary Queen of Scots was known as the Babington Plot, and Mary had been held a prisoner of the English Queen for almost two decades. She was kept in a varying degree of comfort, but she continued to try and scheme to get her way out of her incarceration and house arrest. She agreed to take part in the plot, which would have seen Elizabeth I killed, and then Mary being made the English Queen, and many Catholics across the country backed this. However, Mary would then be sentenced to death, and her execution was arranged to take place inside of Fotheringhay Castle, where she was held. She was told the day before the axe fell that she would be executed the next day, and she spent her final hours getting her affairs in order, but her execution would not go well. She was not executed with a single strike of the axe, and the first blow when she knelt on the scaffold and lay her head on the block missed and hit the back of her head. The axe embedded in the back of her skull, and this blow may have killed Mary, but the job was not done. A second swing was used, and the executioner struck the neck, and it almost severed her head from her body, but for a piece of sinew, which was then sawn through by the axeman. He then picked her head up, and showed it to the crowd, and said, God save the Queen, as the gasps inside the Great Hall of Fotheringhay could be heard. But when the executioner held the head up, Mary's wig slipped, and it came loose, and with this her head fell onto the floor, and it showed that Mary had short grey hair. But then the decision was made to make sure there was a huge clean-up operation, as anything that was touched by the blood of Mary was thrown into the fire of the Great Hall, and even the block and the scaffold were taken down and thrown into the fire, as wood. All of Mary's clothes were also burned, and this stopped Catholics collecting relics from Mary. However, Elizabeth I would regret the execution of Mary Queen of Scots until the day she would die, and she believed that her actions in ordering and signing off the death of another anointed queen would prevent her getting into heaven, and bishops on her deathbed promised the English queen that this would not stop her. She would believe that her privy council had convinced her to do this without her own decision, and she threw one of her advisers in the Tower of London for his advice and counsel with regards to Mary. However, Mary Queen of Scots gave a number of strict and important instructions as to what she would like to be done with her body and remains following her death and she informed people that she wanted to be sent to France, following her death, and that she wanted her body to be laid to rest with her first husband, the King of France, who had died many years before. However, Elizabeth I would not allow this to happen, and she refused Mary this final request, possibly, as it would have been too high profile and costly, to send her remains across the English Channel, and she feared a Catholic uprising. Because of this, there was a significant amount of debate internally, within the royal circles, as to what to do with the remains of Mary Queen of Scots. In the days after her execution, her body was placed inside of a lead lined coffin, and it was left inside of a presence chamber, and a side room inside Fotheringhay Castle, and because of this they were simply left to rot. But her remains had been embalmed also by doctors, and Mary's heart and entrails it's believed were removed from her body, and these were then buried nearby inside the walls of Fotheringhay Castle, encased inside of a lead casket. But then these remains were left inside of the room for many months, and her body was unburied for some time. 
but Elizabeth would not consent to the burial plans, and constant debate remained as to where to bury Mary. Then the final decision was made to bury her inside of Peterborough Cathedral, which was the closest cathedral to the site of her execution, and where she was currently lying in the coffin. The decision to move her coffin took place, and there was a procession from Fotheringhay to Peterborough, and this burial register inside of the cathedral would state, The Queen of Scots was most sumptuously buried in the Cathedral Church of Peterborough, the 1st day of August 1587, who was beheaded at Fotheringhay Castle the 8th of February before. The heralds and officers of Queen Elizabeth I's household arrived a few weeks before, and deliberately chose the burial site to be underneath the floor opposite the body of Henry VIII's first wife Catherine of Aragon, who was also a staunch Catholic and a fierce queen. For the funeral procession, there was a large hearse which arrived from Fotheringhay, and this was pulled by horses who were draped in black cloth, and the cathedral was also decorated with black cloth, and this would have cost a significant amount of money to bury Mary. On the 30th of July between 1 and 2am in 1587, the body of Mary Queen of Scots was brought from Fotheringhay Castle under a procession of torches lighting the way, and the body was placed on a chariot. Mary's friends and members of her household were part of this procession, as was the Bishop and Dean of Peterborough, and when her body got to the cathedral, it was placed in the burial site near to the high altar. But this was of course not what Mary Queen of Scots wanted, and to rub salt into the wounds, Mary's funeral service was carried out in the Protestant way, not adhering to the Catholic beliefs that Mary possessed. She was also not allowed to be buried where she wanted. But in 1603, Elizabeth I died, and then Mary's son James came onto the throne of England, despite the fact he was also the Scottish king. James I, as he was known then, drew up plans to allow his mother to be given a dignified burial, and one which marked her significant place in history. The plans were drafted quickly, but then in 1612, Mary Queen of Scots would be reburied in a huge tomb, which had taken six long years to finish. Her remains were dug up inside of Peterborough Cathedral, and she was unearthed from the ground by grave diggers, and they lifted the body from the vault, and then her body was then taken to Westminster Abbey, on yet again another grand procession. The king granted a royal warrant for the burial of his mother, and James I's huge marble tomb for his mother was placed on the south side of the Lady Chapel, the huge mausoleum for the Tudor kings and queens, inside of Westminster Abbey. The tomb in effigy shows Mary wearing a close-fitting, dignified coif, with a lace ruff and a crowned Scottish lion can be found at her feet. She was buried straight opposite Elizabeth I also, signifying their rivalry, even in death. But Mary's tomb is larger than Elizabeth's, and this was made deliberately. However, this was not the last time that the coffin of Mary Queen of Scots was disturbed. Her coffin, following the reburial ceremony, was placed inside of a vault, and then for two centuries she was laid to rest. However, at some point there was a significant amount of breaking into the vault of Mary and her tomb. Arthur P. Stanley, the Dean of Westminster, was a curious man, and he wanted to find the coffin of King James I, Mary's son, as the remains of this king had been lost to time. Queen Victoria allowed him to carry out searches of the royal vaults, and he then documented what he saw in a completely different light, and Stanley's accounts are the last written descriptions of the coffins we have. James I would be found, interred in the same vault as Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, but there was a rumour that his body had been buried in the same vault as his mother's coffin, and Stanley to confirm this or deny it, broke into the vault of Mary Queen of Scots. He found the tomb and coffin of Mary, and Mary's lead coffin had been placed along the north wall of the vault, and Mary was not on her own in this large vault. There were many other burials inside of it, but the tomb of Mary and her vault had been broken in a number of times to bury further members of the royal family. The coffin of Mary Queen of Scots was found underneath the coffin of Lady Arbella Stuart, which is strange considering she was buried underneath Arbella. And in the vault was also Anne Hyde, the Duchess of York, Henry the Prince of Wales, Elizabeth the Winter Queen of Bohemia, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, and many of James II's children. These were many descendants of the Stuart dynasty, and these were direct descendants in a sense of Mary Queen of Scots. But after Stanley had looked at the coffin of Mary and the others, the vault was sealed up, and it's not believed to have been entered since this day.
The coffin of Mary Queen of Scots was moved a number of times over the centuries, and she was even exhumed and was then buried a hundred miles away from her initial site of burial. But following the large ceremony inside of Westminster Abbey, she was interred under a huge tomb, which was befitting of her role and status in history, and it did cement that she was a queen. However, this vault containing her coffin would be broken into a number of times in the centuries after the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. When the French Revolution broke out, due to the anger of the population against the King Louis XVI and his Queen Marie Antoinette, no one would have believed that shortly the monarchy would be abolished and the King and Queen would make their ways to the guillotine for their executions. What came after was a brutal period of time, known as the Terror, in which the device of death or the nation's razor, as it was known, would fall upon the necks of thousands of people across France. King Louis and his wife were out of touch and were seen as symbols of ridicule as they would spend huge sums of money which could have been used to help the French people who were starving as prices rose and people suffered. But eventually the people would sentence their king and queen to death and they were both executed on the same guillotine. But they were also buried near to each other in the same cemetery and decades later the coffins and graves of the king and queen were broken into and they would be exhumed with the bones dug up of Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI. The French king was formally arrested on the 13th of August 1792, and his ordeal was rough, as he was imprisoned inside of the temple, an ancient prison in Paris. He was forced to abdicate and was deposed, and he was simply known as Louis Capet, and a king no more. The king was then brought to trial and he would be paraded throughout the crowded streets but the people were shocked what was happening as the king was brought in front of the national convention to hear that he had been accused of high treason. Louis XVI was also accused of a large number of crimes against the state and he tried to defend himself as best as he could but he knew that he would be found guilty. He could have been exiled and sent to different countries and lands but he was sentenced to death. In January 1793, the 38-year-old King Louis XVI was taken from his prison to the guillotine inside the Place de la Revolution in Paris. The guillotine was actually brought into commission by Louis himself, and it had been suggested that he even suggested using a slanted blade rather than a curved blade which had been put forward. But he would never have believed that this would take his life. The device would take the heads of thousands following the king's execution in what was known as a reign of terror, but the king's execution began the bloodshed. Louis XVI tried to make a short speech on the scaffold, but was drowned out by the sound of guards and drumming, and he claimed he was innocent of any crime. The executioner then grabbed the king and placed him on the wooden board before he was slid under the guillotine blade, and after a few final checks, the blade was released. It was claimed that the blade did not sever the king's neck as cleanly as it could have, as it may have gone straight through his mouth, and that the king allegedly let out a huge scream when the blade came down. But the executioner claimed that the king went to his death with bravery and decorum. But then following Louis's execution, the king's head was displayed quickly to the crowd, and the remains were then placed inside of a wooden coffin, and were put back on a cart, and transported to the nearby Madeleine Cemetery. The remains of those men and women who were executed at the Place de la Revolution were buried here as it was close by, and the king's remains were purposely thrown into an unmarked grave, and his head was placed between his feet in an act of disgrace, and quick lime was thrown over his body to allow it to decompose quicker, almost in an attempt to erase his rule and life from the face of this earth. The revolutionaries clearly wanted their former king gone, but he would then be exhumed and dug up years later. Many people knew where the king had been buried, and it was no great secret, as maps had even been drawn up of the Madeleine Cemetery, and people came to visit the king's grave and to pay their respects. Some staff of the graveyard even gave tours to tourists and foreign dignitaries, but in May 1814, it was looked into the possibility of having King Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette exhumed, then interred inside of a proper burial site fit for a king and queen. The exhumations began on the 18th of January, 1815, they were performed by many ministers and experts, and the Queen's body was found first and identified by some of her clothing. 
but then the following day Louis's remains were found. The search for him had begun on the first day, and they resumed after night fell the next morning. The authorities had dug a deep trench near to a wall, but the workers found quicklime sediment that had mixed with the earth, and also a number of bits of board from the coffin of Louis. They then came across the broken skeletal remains of a man who had his body covered in quicklime and a skull which was found placed between his leg bones. No clothing was found on the remains that could have helped to identify these bones, but everyone was convinced that this was the king. This is due to the location of the burial and the documented sites of the burial made decades before. The remains of Louis XVI were then placed in a chest and then inside a lead coffin, ready for reburial. One witness said that, on the 20th of January we proceeded, in pursuance of the king's commands, to the house of M. Desclasseau, where we the commissioners had been present at the preceding operations together with other personages, whose right of office or the king's commands had assembled, witnessed the removal of the remains of their majesties into leaden coffins made for that purpose. In the presence of these noble and other personages, we broke the seals and opened the chest in which the remains had been deposited. Those of his majesty were placed in a leaden coffin, together with pieces of lime and wood, and were then soldered down. Upon the lid was fastened a gold plate, with the following inscription, and excuse my French, Ici est le corps du tres haut, très puissant, et très excellent, Prince Louis the Sixteenth. There were some who have claimed that the bones may have been not Louis the Sixteenth that were found, and no official identification occurred, but it was accepted generally that these were correct. It was found in the right recorded spot, and was found buried twelve feet down, and was covered in lime. The search also took a lot longer than that of Marie Antoinette's, there was a lot less of the king to find than the queen. It was clear that this person in the grave had lost their head on the guillotine, but the remains were in a bad way compared to Marie's. Further searches took place to find nearby burials, but there were none nearby that could have been confused as the king. It was said of the exhumation by a witnessing Frenchman that the tomb of Louis XVI was placed here on the 21st of January 1793, at half past ten in the morning. A pit of eight feet depth was dug, and a great deal of quicklime placed in it. The body of the king was placed in a wooden coffin with quicklime on top. On the 16th of October 1793, the body of his queen, his wife, was buried near to him, with a similar quantity of quicklime. The coffin of Louis XVI, after around two decades, had been broken into, and his remains were then planned to have been buried inside of the Basilica of Saint-Denis, and specifically inside of the royal mausoleum befitting their status as kings and queens of France. There was a large reburial ceremony that occurred, and it was said of this that, a detachment of artillery joined the procession at the barrier Saint-Denis, and followed it firing minute guns. A regiment of the king's chasseurs lined the road from Paris to Saint-Denis. The drums and musical instruments were covered with black serge, and the arms and colours of the troops were ornamented with crepe. A deep and solemn silence prevailed among the multitudes who thronged the streets and road by which the procession passed. Upon reaching the church of Saint-Denis, the bodies were taken from the car by the guards de la Manche, and carried into the church, where they were received by the clergy, and presented by the Bishop of Carcasson to the Bishop of Air. They were then placed upon a lofty tomb of state in the midst of the choir. When all these attendants had taken their places, the service commenced. The princes and princesses followed by their Grand Master, the Master of Ceremonies and their assistants approached the altar to present their offerings, after which a funeral oration was delivered by the Bishop of Troy. The absolution having been pronounced, the bodies were lowered into the royal vault, into which Monsieur and the two princes, his sons, descended, and prostrated themselves upon the coffins of their royal relatives. Salutes of artillery were fired at the moment when the procession set out from Paris, during the service of Saint-Denis, and when the bodies were lowered into the vault. To perpetuate the memory of these august victims, the king has ordained that solemn funeral services shall be performed annually in all churches of the kingdom on the 21st of January, for the repose of the soul of Louis the Sixteenth, and on the 16th of October for that of his royal consort, that on those days the court shall wear mourning, and the public offices, courts of justice, exchange and theatres should be closed. The reburial of King Louis the Sixteenth was a huge event, and many of the members of the nobility were there to witness this, but he is remembered in history as a king who had a blatant disregard for the feelings of his people,
and he was a monarch who should have been more in touch with what was happening inside of his lands. If the king had tried to help the plight of the French back in the 1790s, then there could very well have been still a monarchy in France today. But following his execution, his remains were dug up and exhumed. Marie Antoinette was brought by the National Convention of France to a tribunal on the 14th of October 1793, which was accused of many shocking and brutal charges. The courtroom was a farce, and it was decided already that she would die, and many people thought that the verdict was already predetermined. Her lawyers were not allowed to prepare a sufficient defence for her, such was the haste, as the former queen was taken from her prison cell, and she was accused of some of the most serious crimes. These even included incest, as her own son had been turned against her, and accused her of this shocking charge. But Marie was accused of also depleting the national treasury, and handing over a lot of money to Austria, her homeland, which was also said to have been involved in plotting large-scale massacres. It was a short trial, and two days later on the 16th of October she would be found guilty of three major charges, which were high treason against the French people, depleting the national treasury to a huge extent, negatively affecting the finances of the French, and also conspiracy against the security of the state, linked to foreign powers declaring war on the nation. But Marie's lawyers, despite this, were shocked that she would be sentenced to death, and they thought she would be handed back over to the Austrians, and barred from ever coming back to France. But when the death sentence was passed, there was an audible gasp in the courtroom. But to prepare her for her execution, Marie was then sent back briefly to her prison, which was regarded as the antechamber to the guillotine, which would later then be summoned to go to her death. To prepare Marie Antoinette, the former queen, had her hair roughly cut short, to make sure when the guillotine blade fell that her hair did not snag in the blade, and to allow a cut straight through her neck. Also, she was forced to undress in front of her guards and wear a white dress to her execution, despite the fact she wanted to wear black, almost as if she was in mourning for herself and for France. But the cart then arrived to pick her up, and the guards attached a lead to her neck, as if they were walking a dog, and then the cart, containing the former queen and her priest and confidant, then processed slowly throughout the streets of Paris. Its final destination was the Place de la Revolution, and the same guillotine and execution site, where Marie's husband would lose his head months before. The people of Paris could not believe what they were seeing, the former queen on the back of the cart, slowly moving to her death in the procession of the dead, and many shouted abuse and jeered at her, and some also threw objects towards the Queen. But those who saw her would note how she seemed solemn and almost in a trance, and it's believed that she would welcome her execution, as she had a very rough few months, and she knew that her end was coming. She would not speak to the priest with her, and just remained in quiet. But at 12.15pm, the Queen of France got to the scaffold, which was helped out of the cart, was then taken up the stairs of the scaffold where the guillotine stood on top of. Her final words were recorded as, Pardon me, sir, I did not do it on purpose, as she stood on the foot of the executioner when she was making her way up onto the guillotine. Certainly this was not the iconic word she would have hoped to be remembered for. But then the executioner, who was very experienced, placed a wooden board in front of Marie, and she was then secured to it, before the former Queen of France was lowered onto the guillotine, was then slid under the sharp slanted blade. This was an execution device advocated by her own husband, and it's believed that Louis XVI decided upon using the slanted blade rather than the crescent one, and he passed a law that saw the sufficient device being used in his kingdom. But it would take the head off his wife and him. The executioner made the final checks, and then with a push of the lever, the blade fell and directly sliced through Marie's neck and her head was taken off in one swift and sharp blow. The executioner then picked up Marie Antoinette's head, and some images even show him parading it above the crowd on a pike. But following the execution, the former queen's remains were collected up. They were then placed inside of a coffin. Her head was also kept with her, and she was then taken to the Madeleine Cemetery nearby, and the convention ordered that she, like her husband, should be buried in an unmarked grave, with nothing that highlighted her importance. Madame Tussaud would take a death mask off her face during a break whilst the gravediggers were talking and having lunch, and this would then be later used to create waxwork heads of the executed queen. Madame Tussaud would do this to stand the right side of the revolutionaries. However, in the decades following her execution, 
there was a slight restoration of the monarchy, but many people knew where Marie was buried. There were maps drawn up of the rough spot, and also locals gave tours to tourists and foreign dignitaries who wanted to pay their respects to the executed King and Queen of France. But in 1814, King Louis XVIII ordered an investigation into where the remains were, and also what the possibility was of Marie Antoinette's remains being dug up, then reinterred in the Royal Mausoleum inside the Basilica of Saint Denis. Marie Antoinette's remains were found around the 18th of January 1815, and her husband's were found shortly after. When the gravediggers broke the soil in the Madeleine Cemetery, they found the right spot, and they found the coffin of Marie, and they discovered that a layer of quicklime had been thrown on top of the coffin to dissolve her remains quicker, but this had solidified and had not worked properly, meaning the former Queen of France's remains were preserved well compared to others. On her remains, they found the stockings that she'd been forced to wear in prison, and these confirmed her identity as they were the same ones as other prisoners were given in the prison, and the discovery also said that the woman had lost her head at the foot of a sharp instrument that performed the very sharp and clean cut as a guillotine would. On the skull of the Queen, which had been found at her feet in an act of disgrace, was also some hair that remained on her head. But after this, the people who made the discovery would place the remains of the former Queen and any other goods found in the coffin inside of two chests, and then preparations began to bury her in a royal burial site. Around the grave, there were people who were crying, and were praying heavily, and some even fainted, as Marie Antoinette's bones were dug up. Then a huge ceremony took place to inter King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette inside the Basilica of Saint Denis. In this there was a lot of pomp and ceremony, including musicians, who would play as the bones were lowered into the tomb. Still today the remains of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette are laid to rest where they were reburied and they remain controversial figures. In the last few decades many historians have took a more sympathetic approach to the life of Marie Antoinette, and her execution was one which was considered more of a propaganda victory for the revolutionaries than one of grand importance. Marie was at the time a defeated woman, who had witnessed her husband butchered and her children treated terribly, and she should probably have been sent to Austria or been forced to live in exile with the rest of the royal family. But her execution had a profound effect on monarchs all around Europe as these kings and queens began to fear rebellion in their own lands. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.